right, welcome to our unit nine slides. So this video is just going to be one long video going over all the lecture materials for unit nine about intelligence, AKA modules 60 through 64. What I'm going to do is I'll put links each day to the same video. You're just going to start at different times. So like the first day is probably going to be about five minutes long, and then you'll start day two at the five minute mark and day three at the 10 minute mark or whatever it might be. So instead of just individual videos, it's one long video for this unit. Um, so let's get into it. This whole unit, it's a little bit shorter and it is about intelligence. We ah, go back. <laughs> we all have different ideas about what intelligence is. And in psychology, it's defined as a specific thing. So that's what we're going to look at. And we're going to be understanding what it is, how we assess it, different theories on it, stuff like that. So let's jump right into it and get started with our first day. So today you're going to define intelligence and describe how different theories explain it. And then also look at the pros and cons of those theories. So again, you are at this point, you should have clicked open for the lecture notes. Welcome. Um, and this is module 60. So to start off, the most important thing is to understand what does the AP Psych course define intelligence as? And in psychology, intelligence def is defined as the ability to learn from experience, solve problems, and use knowledge to adapt to new situations. So again, you're going to be taking notes in your packet. So you will add this to your packet, take the notes on it. If you need to pause the video at any point while you're doing this, by all means, pause it. Okay, so there isn't just one type of intelligence, right? I think we know that. Like you can be, I think the common thing is you hear street smarts or like common sense smart versus book smart. Um, we're all intelligent in different ways and we define intelligence differently. And one of these other forms of intelligence that the psychology um, course likes to focus in on is emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is the ability to perceive, understand, manage, and use emotions. Some people are better at this than others for a variety of reasons. Maybe you grew up in a household where it was okay to talk about your emotions. Maybe you grew up in a culture where um, it wasn't okay to talk about these things. We also have talked about how gender influences this, right? Like our ideas about what it means to be male versus female. And a lot of times it's okay to be emotional if you're a woman, but as a guy, God forbid you cry or talk about your feelings, right? Um, obviously we challenged that in previous units, but emotional intelligence is something that some people have more of, some people have less of, but to understand it, we have to define kind of these components of it. So there's four components of emotional intelligence. First, there's perceiving emotions. So understanding what is the emotion that I'm feeling. So let's say, for example, you're feeling anxious. You can say, this is anxiety because my heart is racing. Um, I can't breathe very well. My hands feel tingly. Um, I'm acting erratically, whatever it might be. Then understanding this, so understanding that, yes, this is anxiety. Anxiety is affecting me this way. It's making me feel this way, whatever might be going on. Three, managing the emotion. So saying, okay, if I'm anxious, what can I do to help this? Whether that is going to therapy, having medication, deep breathing exercises, meditation, going on a walk, listening to music, whatever it might be, how you manage that. And then finally, using that emotion to enable creative thinking. So how can you use this, what you're feeling, to try to channel into something differently? So that is emotional intelligence and the components of it. Um, and again, obviously, intelligence is different for each person. Emotional intelligence is different. But these are some of the things that um, we want to think about when we're defining what it is. So those are the only notes for today, for day one. What you're going to do with the remaining time um, is you're going to be looking at different theories on intelligence. I have it here that you're going to do this in a jigsaw. However, I can only control so much while I'm not in the building. So if you would like to work with a small group, you can divide this into um, have each person work on one part of it. If you'd rather work with a partner, you can do two. They can do two. If you want to work by yourself, by all means, I'm sure Mr. Lee's fine with that. 
but you're going to be looking at different theories of intelligence, which are on the next slide. And you're going to basically kind of talk about what that theory is, what are the pros and what are the cons of it. Um, you can use the info from the slide. It's also in module 16, the textbook. I'm actually just gonna talk through the info a little bit. So if you wanna listen to me talk through it as well, if that's helpful, by all means, you can listen. If you don't want to, move forward, pause, go forward, whatever you need to do. So there's four theories on intelligence. There's Spearman's general intelligence, Thurston's primary mental abilities, Gardner's multiple intelligences, and Sternberg's triarchic theory. So as you'll see here in the chart from module 60, there's a summary, strengths, and then other considerations, which is essentially like the cons to it. So Spearman's general intelligence, which is also defined as G, is this idea that there's a basic intelligence that predicts our abilities in varied academic areas. So it's basically just saying that we have this general way of measuring intelligence. Everybody has this kind of a number and it is basically says, all right, well, this is what you are. The strengths of this is that um, it can test different abilities such as, or that it can understand different abilities such as verbal and spatial. And um, you tend to see some correlation with it. The other considerations though, the cons are that like, can we really define intelligence as one number? Some people, a lot of people would say no. Next is Thurstone's primary mental abilities. And this is basically, um, he says that there's seven components of intelligence. There's word fluency, verbal comprehension, spatial ability, perceptual speed, numerical ability, inductive reasoning, and memory. All these things then, um, they kind of measure, you can see like, how well can you understand what people are saying? Um, how quickly can you react to things? How can you understand numbers? Um, what's your memory like? Um, simple things, right? Things that we've learned since we were kids and that develops over time. Um, but it is more diverse than the general intelligence. So that's the strength of it. Um, it's not just a single score. So it's so it could be a little bit more informative because there's more components. However, is seven enough? <laughs> um, or is there more to us than that? So even Thurstone's seven mental abilities show a tendency to cluster, um, meaning like if somebody is good with word fluency, they're probably, they might also be good with verbal comprehension. Um, and this could potentially suggest that there's an underlying intelligence there as well. Next, we have Gardner's multiple intelligencies, which is just a step above Thurstone. He says that we are classified into eight independent intelligences, um, and it has a more broad range of skills that goes beyond just school or academic um, smarts. So it includes a wider array of things. Um, so it's not just saying that you're only smart if you can read, if you can do math problems, if you can use inductive reasoning. It's like, well, can you also interact with people? Can you, um, yeah, things like that. Um, so the strength of this is that intelligence is more than just verbal and mathematical skills. There's other things that make us intelligent in our life. But then the other considerations, as always, the cons, should all of our abilities be considered intelligences? Like if you're good at dancing, does that make you intelligent or does that just mean you have a talent for it? That's the question. And finally, we have the triarchic theory, which is that our intelligence is triarchic. I don't know, maybe I pronounced that wrong. Um, our intelligence is best classified into three areas, the, hence the tri, um, that predicts real world success. We have analytical, creative, and practical intelligences. Um, pros, these three facets can be reliably measured. They have different ways to look at this, but they, um, they might share an underlying common denominator again and also like you have to do a lot of testing to see like do these things reliably predict success just because you do well in a test of analytical creative or practical reasoning does that mean you're going to be successful in life right some people are really good test takers um but they are really lazy or they have no person to person skills or whatever else it might be so maybe they're not as successful um, also then what is success, right? There's a whole other philosophical conversation for that, but generally these are the four theories on intelligence. This is just 
these are just four theories, four ways of thinking about it. As with everything we've talked about in psychology, this doesn't cover everything. We are so much more than one man's theory on things. So it's, it's a little bit hard to actually really understand what is intelligence. And that's why we still are looking at this and why we have to measure it and develop new ways to look at it and all that good stuff. So that is it for module 60. I am going to move on to module 61 in a second, but you are going to complete the applying your understanding questions before you do that. And then you're done with day one. Um, you'll pause this video. You'll come back to it tomorrow and you will start at whatever time this ended. So good luck with the rest of the lesson. All right, welcome to day two. So yesterday you, you learned about what intelligence is or what people posit it to be. Today you're gonna to be looking at how we assess it. So you're gonna describe how intelligence is assessed and evaluate the effectiveness of said tests. All right, so module 61 is again all about assessment. So an intelligence test is a method for assessing an individual's mental aptitudes and comparing them with those of others using numerical scores. Basically, it's like if you've ever heard of an IQ test, this is one form of assessing intelligence. So you're gonna look at what are some of these tests and then also kind of understanding, are they, is this actually effective? So, um, a couple terms that you need to understand before we look at these tests. Um, what makes an effective test? So we're going to look at standardization, reliability, and validity. So standardization is the ability to have meaningful scores by comparing them to a pre-tested group. And it's important because it allows for uniform testing procedures. That's why we have things called standardized tests, right? These are tests like the Regents as a standardized test, the SAT, the ACT, um, if you're in college and you're looking to apply to grad school, like the GRE, the MCAT, the GMAT, the LSAT, all those things. Um, these are standardized tests because they have basically, they wrote the test, they have people take it, they then standardize the scores and everybody does the same thing. It helps create this uniform testing procedure. Everybody has a certain amount of time. This is when they do it. This is how they do it. So you can try to look at the scores and say like, well, this is where people are falling helps make the test effective. So you can measure and see how efficient or how intelligent somebody is, ideally. <laughs> Next, we have reliability. Reliability is the extent to which a test yields consistent results, meaning similar results. Um, and it is assessed by scores on two halves of the test, um, on alternate forms or on retesting. It's important because it helps us tell if the test can be trusted. So again, if it's reliable, it means you can trust it. Just like having a reliable friend, somebody that you can count on, we want our tests to be reliable as well. If they're not reliable, what's the point? <laughs> and then finally, we have validity. The validity is the extent to which a test measures what it promises. There is content validity, aka the test reflects the intended topic, and predictive validity. The test projects or anticipates the intended behavior. So this would be like, so for example, with content validity, if I teach you about unit nine, which is all about intelligence, and I say you're going to have a test at the end of it that assesses what you've learned, that test should assess everything I taught you. If I give you a test that is about a completely different topic, that is not valid. It is not because it's not testing what I taught you. Um, and then predictive validity, again, tests anticipated or anticipates intended behavior. So this would be something like um, a college entrance exam. Um, it, like the SAT, it's giving you things. It's like, you should have learned this in high school. And because you learned this in high school, it's predicting how well you'll be able to do in college. I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's what it's supposed to do, right? Um, validity is important because it helps us tell if the test is appropriate for what it's testing. So these are things that help make tests effective. Now there are different types of, um, obviously there's a million different types of tests, but when we're talking about intelligence tests, these are the main ones. We have one called the Stanford Binet. We have achievement tests, we have aptitude tests, and we have the WAIS, uh, W-A-I-S. 
So the Stanford Binet um, assesses cognitive ability and intelligence. So um, it measures five factors, knowledge, quantitative reasoning, visual spatial processing, working memory, and fluid reasoning. It includes verbal and nonverbal subtests. An achievement test is a test designed to assess what a person has learned, um, aka like a unit test. You guys take achievement tests in school all the time. So be like, all right, you guys learned everything in unit eight. You have a test. That's that. The Regents is an achievement test. The SAT, yeah, the SAT is not. Eh, kind of, I guess. Um, yeah, so any of these kinds of tests. Then there's an aptitude test. An aptitude test is designed to predict a person's future performance. Aptitude is the capacity to learn. So um, when I was growing up, always aptitude tests were like, they were kind of like these job tests. So it was like you took this test and told you, oh, these are the things that you would be good at based on the things that you said you like. But again, this is a test that kind of is looking at how you could do at something in the future. And then there is the WAIS, which is the most widely used intelligence test. It contains verbal and performance or nonverbal subtests, um, includes tests about similarities, um, block design, number sequencing, and vocab. So just a variety of things. You're actually going to get a look at some of these tests um, in a moment. There is also something you've probably heard of, which is IQ. Um, a lot of times people say, if you have a high IQ, it means you're really intelligent. Um, sure, <laughs> maybe, maybe it does. Uh, but again, as we know, a lot of things contribute to what intelligence is. Um, so IQ is measured by dividing your mental age by your chronological age and then multiplying it by 100. So your chronological age is literally how old you are. So like if you are 18 years old, um, that would be, you put that on the bottom. Um, the mental age is what is assessed through an IQ test. Um, so you would take a test um, that, would that would basically measure your mental age, and then you divide that score by the chronological age and multiply it by 100. So um, over here is the mental age. As I just kind of said, it is a measure of intelligence test performance. It was devised by Binet, who was the psychologist that helped develop the Stanford Binet test. Um, the chronological age that most typically corresponds to a given level of performance. So basically, like they're hoping to see that, like, okay, if you are 18 years old, you take the test, you should score hopefully around, like it should say that your mental age is pretty close to your chronological age, that you are reasoning like a normal 18 year old. Maybe you reason a little bit higher. Um, you might be a little bit lower and then you multiply that hundred and you get your IQ. Again, a lot of things can influence tests. We've obviously talked about this a little bit. There's confounding variables. Maybe you take the test, you're having a bad day. Um, maybe it's just not really effective at assessing the kind of intelligence that you might possess. So with everything, it's a number, right? Uh, it does not define you. If you take an IQ test and you score really low, doesn't mean you're an idiot by any means. Um, take it again if you want to, but also just move on and know that you're intelligent in many other ways. All right. So, um, you are going to have the opportunity to take some of these intelligence tests if you would like to. Um, there is here a link to an IQ test. There's a link to the Stanford Binet and a link to an aptitude test. Um, this is not the full Stanford Binet test. Uh, you have to pay for it and I'm not doing that, but it's a little bit of a preview for it. That is it for day two. So again, you will, you're done with today. Pause the video. You'll come back to it. Start where you left off with day three. All right, so day three is all about how intelligence changes over time because it does, right? So there aren't really any lecture notes for me today. You're actually just going to um, complete the reading and the questions in your packet to understand this. And then you're going to do the applying your understanding questions. I believe that is all I have to say for day three. So um, everything is in your packet. If you have any questions, obviously ask Mr. Lee, let me know, um, or talk to somebody around you. I'm sure you can figure it out. All right.
So day three didn't include me doing much talking. So you're moving on to day four. Um, day four is all about influences on intelligence and different differences amongst different groups. Um, so you're going to explain how different factors such as biology, our experiences, et cetera, influence intelligence and how intelligence differs among groups. So you are going to do this by doing a little bit of an investigation. So you're going to use the next slides to investigate different topics about influences on intelligence. You're going to read the information and answer the questions in your packet. If you'd like to work with a partner or a small group, by all means, feel free to do so. If you'd like to work independently, up to you. Um, do what's best for you, right? You are, uh, you know what helps you learn best. So um, I'm going to kind of talk through the the information on these slides. This is also um, can be found in modules 30, 36, sorry, 63 and 64. Okay, so the first topic that you're looking at, um, again, is you can divide this up or you can look at this independently. I'm just gonna kind of talk through this quickly. So the first topic is genetic influences. So how do our genes influence our intelligence? So one of the ways that we look at this is through twin studies. We've talked about twin studies before when we talked about development. Um, twin studies um, are really useful in helping us understand how nature versus nurture works. So um, intelligence test scores of identical twins raised together are virtually as similar as those of the same person taking the same test, test twice, aka they're very similar, which is pretty crazy, right? Um, and that goes to show just how influential genes can be. The fact that two different people can take an intelligence test and the scores, it looks like that person took the test just twice, is pretty crazy. Um, estimates of heritability, aka how um, the percentage of what is passed on to you. So estimates of heritability of intelligence, the extent to which intelligence test score variation can be attributed to genetic variation, ranges from 50 to 80%, meaning your intelligence is very influenced by your genes. But that is not to say though, that like, let's say your parents, like one of your parents is the smartest people, smartest person, you know, um, like did amazing on different tests, always had straight A's, like super successful, whatever. Um, that doesn't automatically mean that you are going to be the most intelligent person. Uh, because other things can influence you, what experiences you've had, your own motivation, whatever it might be. But there's a good chance that you're probably going to be pretty smart if you have a smart parent, just based on statistical studies. Another way that we're able to look at genetic influences is through adoption studies. Again, we've talked about these before as well. Um, but during childhood, uh, intelligent test scores of adoptive siblings correlate, meaning they're pretty similar. Um, so like if you live in a home and you, if you live, you have a sibling who was adopted, um, they're not genetically related to you, but you might have pretty similar test scores because you are growing up in a similar environment. However, these similarities between adopted children and their adoptive families decrease as you get older until the similarities approach nearly zero by adulthood, meaning Genetic influences become more apparent as we accumulate life experience. And so that's saying like, as you get older, it becomes more apparent how influential your genes have been and how less influential your experiences have been. Um, but again, this isn't always true, right? We're all individuals. We're all very different. And just because one person's genes have been super influential doesn't always mean that yours are going to be. This is just what we've seen from various studies. Topic two, environmental influences. So how does our environment influence our intelligence? Um, early in childhood, home environment and socioeconomic status have a large influence on the development of intelligence. Children who grow up in impoverished environments or without social interaction may develop in a way that negatively impacts intelligence. Meaning if you have less, um, it can have a negative impact on how intelligent you may be. Later on though, School plays an important role in the development of intelligence. So it's not to say, say you grow up really poor, you don't have a lot. Um, that doesn't mean that you're always going to be behind. School, especially if you get a good education, can be one of the most important things in helping you develop um, intelligence. 
Um, so school can really boost chances for success later in life. However, the unfortunate reality is many people who grow up in poverty also go to schools that are impoverished as well. They're in communities that are not receiving enough funding. So the cycle of poverty continues. And it's not that these individuals who are living in this condition are less intelligent. It's that the world and society has unfortunately created an environment that has not benefited them and has put them lower. Um, it's not a genetic thing. It is not something that they've chosen. It's how our messed up society works, unfortunately. Topic three, gender differences. So there are some differences in gender. Males and females tend to have the same average intelligence test scores, meaning one gender is not better than the other, but they do differ in specific abilities. Girls are better spellers, typically. They're more verbally fluent. They're better at locating objects, better at detecting emotions, and more sensitive to touch, taste, and color. This is not to say every girl. There are definitely some girls who are probably not good at detecting emotions, who are horrible spellers. I mean, I know plenty of people that are, plenty of my friends are really bad at spelling, right? So it's not to say every single person who identifies as a woman is good at these things, or every person who identifies as a man is bad at those things. Uh, but generally, this is what we found. Um, additionally, boys outperform girls at spatial ability and related mathematics, though girls outperform boys in math computation. Boys also outnumber girls at the low and high extremes of mental abilities. So there's more a higher population of boys who score really low, but also who score really high. And there's more girls who fall in the middle. A lot of these things, though, maybe they're influenced by your genetics. But some of these things could be influenced by, again, our predispositions about what it means to be male or female, right? Like we teach girls that's okay to be not that, but that you should be emotional. So it makes sense that they're better at detecting emotions. We teach men that you're not supposed to be emotional, right? Um, so again, it makes sense that they may not be able to detect emotions as well. So it's important that we break down those gender um, norms that we as a society have instilled in order to help us kind of overcome these, uh, these differences. Next topic is racial and ethnic differences. So racial and ethnic groups differ in their average intelligence test scores. Evidence suggests that environmental differences are largely, or perhaps entirely, which I would argue, responsible for these differences. So again, this is not saying, and I want you to understand this very clearly, one race is not smarter than the other. The reason why these differences exist is because of the environments that we have created as humans that have made it for one race to be more successful than the other. AKA you might see more people, white people scoring better on these tests because they've had more resources and you might see another race scoring lower on it um, than, than another because they haven't had the resources to succeed as much. It says here in this bullet point, this means it's not that one race is smarter than another. It says some races are provided more resources to succeed and therefore develop in a way that supports increased intelligence. All right, next topic, the question of bias. So are intelligence tests biased? I think this is pretty easy <laughs> to, to say, yeah, they are. Every test is biased. Um, ev most things are biased, right? Because a, a human, for the most part, has, has created them. Even if we have robotic or like, you know, AI, whatever, whatever is going on. I don't even want to talk about. It. But we have things that, you know, might seem like they're unbiased or they're um, objective, but they're still, they've been created by humans. And all humans have experiences that influence what we do. So yes, an intelligence test is going to be biased because a person has created it and they've created it with some sort of purpose, maybe an agenda, whatever it might be. So the bullet point says yes, because they're measured your developed abilities, which reflect in part your education and cultural experiences. So, it, I mean, how do you make a test that effectively assesses every single human being, right? 
you, you just can't. Um, so something else to consider about bias in these tests is something called a stereotype threat. Um, a stereotype threat is a self-confirming concern that one will be evaluated based on a negative stereotype, and this can affect your performance on any type of test. So, like, you go into taking this test, and you're like, well, I'm already going to do bad on this because I'm really bad at this, or because people like me have historically done bad on this. And that can then influence how you do on the test because there's this prior stereotype about it, and then you don't perform well on it. So that can also influence your performance. There's a lot of things that can influence performance, but this is one of those things. Okay, and that is it for those different topic questions. Um, the last thing you need to do is complete the applying your understanding questions. And then that is it for unit nine. I guess it's a little bit of a shorter unit. Um, you're going to be making your own intelligence tests actually. So using this information, you can always come back to this uh, video, play it, listen to it, do what you gotta do. But um, yeah, that's it.